The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Okay, we just have the the tea walla. Water, okay. That's good. Extra just in case. So, welcome everybody to today's uh, meditation retreat. See how much um, meditation we can actually do, not just talking about it, but doing it. The idea of meditation is to learning how to get your mind to be really still and peaceful. When it's peaceful and still, amazing things happen. The biggest problem people have with meditation is their restless mind. Always wanting something, searching for something, wanting to get something. As I did mention yesterday, that one of the most important teachings of, of uh, my master, Ajahn Chah, was we meditate to let go of things, and not to get more things. So our goal, if you call it a goal, is actually to simplify, to let go of so many things. So we come here today, and the food will be provided later, there's nothing you really need right now. So all you really need to do is just to be here. To be here, not going anywhere, not doing anything, but just learning how to relax and rest. And of those many stories which I've said about meditation, there was one uh, which comes to my mind when I was uh, doing a, a conference, one, a happiness conference, uh, in Sydney, there was a professor from uh, Stanford University, which was very rich university, very well endowed, and he managed to get to get funding for an experiment on meditation and other forms of relaxation. He split his class into two, and at random, he sent half of them to a meditation retreat for the day, just like you're doing here. And the other half, he sent all expenses paid to a Californian spa. <laughs> and in a spa, I've never been to a spa, but they say they have like hot baths and massage and hot oil and stones, I don't know what else they do over there. But he wanted to find out the efficacy of meditation. And at the end of the day, they brought both groups back, gave them a standard psychology test, and the results were stunning. That the people who went to the spa were far more relaxed than the people who went to meditation. <laughs> and which told me that somewhere some people don't know how to teach meditation. <laughs> that is not meditation as far as I understand it that with meditation you relax the body so deeply that it's better than going to a spa and it's certainly far cheaper. <laughs> and also, you don't only relax the body, you relax the mind, that you get to a wonderful state of stillness. Because stillness is the key. Just to get these little basic meditation housekeeping rules, you know, just out of the way. Uh, some of the translations of these Pali terms, ancient terms like samadhi and calling it concentration, is something which I have uh, been very disappointed with for so many years because meditation has got nothing to do with concentration. Concentration which is done through force through willpower, never reaches a place of stillness. And indeed, the word for samadhi does not mean concentration. It was a word which was suggested by Professor Rice Davids in the 1860s as a way of trying to describe what happens when you practice this Buddhist meditation method. It was a good idea, a nice stab, he was also the one who actually coined the word mindfulness. That was brilliant. 
but he was not brilliant when it came to uh, the idea of samadhi, meaning concentration. It means something a lot different, stillness. And of course, how can you be still? And of course, this is my usual exercise. I usually hold out a glass of water. And my job, my purpose, is to try and make this glass, this cup of water, be perfectly still. The water represents my mind, and trying to make this still is the job of meditation. So now, Venerable Arana Vihari, because you know there's no such thing as a free lunch, so I have to make you work now. <laughs> <laughs> and you've done this before with me. This cup of water is the water. Has it stopped moving yet, or is it still agitated? Still. Yes. Why? Because I'm not being mindful. I'm paying no attention to it. I'll now be mindful of it. Has it stopped moving yet? Still is moving. Because I'm not concentrating. I will now be mindful and concentrate. Has it stopped moving yet? A little bit more moving. Now this is not a joke. I don't play around here. When you concentrate, your mind moves even more. Have you ever noticed that? So what I do is there's a very simple way. What I was taught by monks like Ajahn Chah, and when you go back to read the original teachings of the Buddha, you see it in there too. A very easy way of keeping this water perfectly still. With so much ease, you put it down. Have you ever heard the word let go, detach, don't grasp, leave things alone? If you put it down, it becomes peaceful, all by itself. Now, when I run away, hurry. That water, is it still? Yes. There's no way I could hold it that still. Now that is a very important little message there. This is how we meditate. This is how we don't meditate. <laughs> <laughs> And that means that people do get stressed out trying to meditate, and they'd rather go to a spa where they get much more peaceful. <laughs> so we can't afford going to a spa. So instead, we can learn how to make the mind and the body just so peaceful by learning how to leave it alone, to let it go, to put it down, and stop worrying about it. In other words, stop being so restless. What is restlessness anyway? Why do people think so much? And there's two reasons why people think so much. The first reason is they believe that by thinking they can solve their problems. And that they can work out the meaning of existence. That they can uh, figure out the cause of all their problems. Have you ever noticed that thinking never actually gets to a solution, but it just makes more thoughts? And the great insights, where we do actually literally think outside the box, we see beyond, that always comes when our mind is perfectly still. And the usual um, example which everybody has experienced is when you can't remember somebody's name. And that happens to me so often, not because of my age, it's because I go to so many different Buddhist communities, so many different countries, so many different groups, and sometimes, sometimes people come to me and say, oh, I saw you in Jakarta last week, do you remember me? And I say, listen, there was two and a half thousand people there. <laughs> of course I can't remember you. But, it was wonderful just to know that if you are very peaceful and still, solutions come up, names come up. And this is one of the great ways of innovation. This is just the side effect of meditation. Those of you who have really difficult problems to solve in life, 
Learn how to be still. And then answers tend to come up. Really strange, innovative answers. Because of my connections in science, that one of the, uh, the people which I was always impressed with was a physicist called Brian Josephson of Cambridge. Uh, he, he was a person who uh, basically, he developed the idea of quantum tunneling. And it became the basis for um, supercomputing. And of course, at the time, his discovery was not accepted. It was impossible, it was considered to be crazy. But eventually, experiments proved he was right, and he was awarded a Nobel Prize for physics. And the reason I mention that person, because he got that insight after meditating, at the end of his meditation. It was a meditation produced Nobel Prize. And that's not a joke. And there's many people like that who actually make incredible breakthroughs because most thinking just goes one thought after another thought after another thought. It goes in a narrow line. But when we're peaceful and still, we can see so many different ways. Thinking is just basically working over old stuff. Being still is where innovation begins. So stillness is a marvelous ground, a fertile ground of new understandings and solutions to intractable problems. So I say that in order to try and undermine your reliance on thinking as a problem solver. Instead, we develop our emotional wisdom and feeling so we understand. But of course, how do we become that still? And that is the most difficult thing. And oh, the other thing which I was um, going to say, oh, please find a seat somewhere. There's some seats up on the stage here, but you have to shave your hair off to get those. <laughs> that's of course. <laughs> And that's one thing about uh, uh, stillness. And the other thing about like stillness is stillness is not a a, a state which is um, static. Stillness grows and develops. This is you know, sometimes people used to ask me about Ajahn Chah's title of his book, Still Water Flowing, like some Zen koan. What does it mean? If it's still, it can't be flowing. But the truth of the matter is, when your mind becomes still, it starts to develop. It gets more energized. It dives deeper in to itself and into the reality of existence. As things which you thought were stable and solid tend to vanish and disappear as you go deeper and deeper into things. So there's many different levels of stillness. And what you think is the most still state you could ever experience, it goes deeper and deeper. It's a way to experience profound reality through stillness. And it's not something which is beyond anybody. Sometimes, that I've been caught out. I've been caught stereotyping people. You know, sometimes we do that. You know, we see somebody, in this particular case, it was a, a maybe a 20, 30 year old man who came to one of my meditation retreats in Perth. And this 20 or 30 year old man, he was, he didn't look like a typical meditator, whatever a typical meditator is. Because he was really big, he had curly hair, he was Caucasian, and he had tattoos all over him. He looked some really rough guy. And for those of you who visited uh, the retreat center, which I built over in Perth, in Jarnagrove, Grove, six kilometers from there is a prison. And so I assumed that this fellow 
was uh, got the wrong place. And I said, if you want to visit your friends, they're up the road six kilometers. This is a Buddhist meditation retreat. <laughs> Sometimes you do make stupid mistakes, and I make those stupid mistakes all the time. And I tell everyone about it, it makes it fun. It's making stupid mistakes as a teacher, when I run Rihara, it gives you more sort of uh, material for your talks. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but he said no, he was booked on the retreat, and I checked, his name was down there. And that was the man who was the star meditator of that retreat. You know, he achieved these incredible states, which, you know, probably talk about later on, called the jhanas. And I don't, you know, say a person's got a jhana unless I'm really, really sure. And this fellow had one. The last person I'd ever expect. But then, the reason I repeat that is because each one of you, if you haven't got a jhana yet, after all these years of meditating, get some tattoos. <laughs> No, that's only a joke, don't do that. <laughs> there we go, there's the <laughs> fellow there. Yay! <laughs> and it was just, no, just chat. <laughs> Very good, excellent. But um, what happens is that any human being, if they know how to let go and be still, that is how they can get into some of the deepest of states of meditation. And that is where you find the most profound, deepest teachings of the Buddha. Not in the books. The books are just like the, the lonely planet guide to meditation. It's like they describe an area of humanity, of the mind, and what happens inside. And it's the same any other teachings you get. They're just the words which are pointing the way to a deep experience of the mind. And to explain what I mean, I went to our Bhikkhuni monastery in Perth uh, once, and they asked for us actually to do a committee meeting. And then they asked, can we have a teaching? I said, I have to run off. Just any old teaching, quick one. And so I said, oh, look, I need to go to the toilet. Can you please tell me where the toilet is? Now I've built a lot of that place. I know, and I looked over the designs of it as well. So I know where everything is. They were a bit surprised what I was up to. I was obviously, obviously up to one of my tricks. And they said, oh, the toilet's there. You can see it, just male toilet. So I went to the toilet door, and I pretended, I never did it, I pretended to urinate on the door. It was quite kosher, it wasn't, I didn't do anything. But they said, what are you doing? I said, this is my Dhamma teacher, which you won't forget. He said, that was the toilet there. And so it says, male toilet, on the door. So that's where I was pretending to urinate. And they said, it's inside. Oh, why didn't you put that on the label there, on the sign? Male toilet, inside. Because words, descriptions, signs, they can, if you take them just on face value, they can be very deceiving. So when you see male toilet or female toilet, you put it on the door, exit, is that a door over there, what well, I can see? That's not the exit. The exit's on the other side of the door. So this is one of the reasons why that the words can be misunderstood so easily, which is why that we learn how to get way beyond those words into silence. And of course, the other reason why uh, that people um, find it difficult to actually to be away from silence. Ooh, that must be a ghost. Boom, boom, boom going bang in the night. So please turn off your mobile phones, or anything which goes beep, beep. And imagine, I sometimes imagine, what would have happened if they had, you know, you know why they call them cell phones, don't you? Because they imprison you, that's why they call cell phones. <laughs> and to prove the point, that you find that just the more bars you have on your signal, 
What, where do bars and cells come from? The more imprisoned you are. If you have no bars on your, you know, your little thing which says what your reception is, the fewer bars, the more freedom. So it's, you know, it's a cell phone. And actually the other little joke, just to let you know, is you know that your body, your body is a prison, and I can prove it very easily, why your body is a prison. Because it's made up of cells. <laughs> <laughs> At last I've got one you haven't heard before, which you like. Hooray, success. I can go home now. <laughs> but anyway, your body is a bit of a prison because when you meditate, that's one of the first things we have to be, get so still, so peaceful. So our body just disappears and vanishes. What a wonderful thing that is. Not to feel hot, not to feel cold, not to feel itchy, but to go beyond that. So what we actually do is when we start meditating, you know, to be able to calm everything down, we just learn how to be, sit comfortably. And you don't need to sit on the floor to get nice meditation. You can sit on chairs. So well done all those people sitting on chairs. You probably get much deeper meditation than all these people who are trying to prove something by sitting on the floor. <laughs> Doesn't matter, sometimes you're more comfortable on the floor, which is fine. Some of the best seats in a Buddhist meditation center, the ones which usually go first, are the ones which are, allow you to lean against the wall. You are very smart over there. Oh, you actually haven't leaned against the wall yet. But that's actually, because it's very comfortable. The idea is, this is not indulgence. It's finding the comfortable place for your body so you can let go of all concern for the body. It's fine. And you can let it go. In the same way that where you parked your car today. Hopefully, not in somebody's driveway. <laughs> Otherwise, somebody come rushing in like they did last year. Say, ah, could somebody move this car? But it can't be as bad as some of the disciples in Perth who want to waste that, not this year, thank goodness, but the year before. Though we told everybody, look, we have to park with kindness to our neighbors. And the ranger, the ranger will be doing a tour to make sure everybody is parking properly. Because they had complaints from the locals, and so the council ranger came around. And somebody, they parked in front of the ranger, so the ranger couldn't get out. <laughs> he was hemmed in. <laughs> I think that was going a bit too far. They got fined, and there's no way you can talk the ranger out of, of forgiving that one, because that was really stupid. And so <laughs> that reminds me of, of Voltaire's famous saying. The only way, this was like, you know, Voltaire was a great philosopher, playwright, and an amazing sort of sense of humor. He said the only way to really understand the mathematical concept of infinity, which, you know, infinity is a huge word, the only way to really understand that is start to thinking about the extent of human stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, it's quite true. You know, maybe we don't like to admit it, but some of the stupid things we do. And anyway, we go back to just learning just how to relax our body, sitting comfortably. And even for those of you traditional Buddhists, even the Buddha, he sat under a Bodhi tree in the shade. In those days, Bald Gaya, Uwele it was called, was uh, like a park. It was like the domain, but with nobody there. A beautiful tree, a nice river. He just had an incredible meal, which was made for heavenly beings by Sujata. And he got some grass to make a nice, comfortable seat to sit on. And there, well-fed, comfortable, quiet, then he sat and managed to get into deep meditation. There was no force involved. There was a letting go involved. A letting go and in comfort too. 
So, I've got into the habit teaching meditation now to allow people to really experience, be mindful of their body first of all. And even the Buddha said, Kaya Gata Sati, the mindfulness of the body is of great value. And it's very important at the beginning of the meditation to be aware of this vehicle which one uses. And again, going back to that car simile, if you know your car is well parked, it's locked up, no valuables are visible through the window, you've looked after it, it's safe. Which means you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be there for you when the meditation day is over. The same with your body, you make sure it's all set up quite uh, correctly, comfortable, not too hot, not too cold, and you can leave it alone for half an hour, an hour, or even longer. And it will be fine when you come out of your meditation. So you look after your body first of all. And it also develops the two most important parts of basically what you do, or rather what you don't do. The mindfulness and the kindness. Kindness is another word for letting go. Opening the door of your heart to somebody, as I was saying in Wolverton Town Hall on my first evening here. Learning how to love yourself is opening the door of your heart, not trying to change yourself, but just being kind to yourself. With all of your failings and faults, you're not a perfect human being. No one is. But you're kind to this body. When you have that beautiful kindness, it's letting it be with caring for it and mindfulness. It's just so easy to relax everything in your body. Relaxing. By relaxing this body, you are preparing it for meditation. And once this body is cared for and relaxed, it's amazing just what your body feels like. It does actually feel like the people who went to the spa. Relaxed and delightful. So, of course, I can never afford a spa. don't have any money. But I know how to relax my body. Relax it to the max. So it feels so nice. So nice. The pleasure of relaxation. Sometimes, as a Buddhist, I was afraid of pleasure, delight. You'll get attached. That's wrong. There are some pleasures and delights which lead you deeper into letting go. And the delight of a relaxed body is one of them. As soon as I felt my body just so relaxed, and I focused on the delight which was right in front of me, then the body got more relaxed. It was a vehicle to really get into deep relaxation of the body. Once the body was really relaxed, then I could let it go. It wasn't a problem. It's like having parked my car, put the security system on in a really good place, so it would be there for me later. Nothing to worry about. And then I could go into my emotional world, the mind. And especially with that emotional world, the mind, it was, first of all, just all this thinking. Why are you thinking? And the other thing I was going to mention about thought, one of the reasons we think too much is because we're afraid of what will happen if we don't think. We're not used to silence. And so because of that, because people just think, how can you be silent? Then you just fall asleep, you become unconscious. It's the nature of the brain to think. And to prove them wrong, I usually perform this, this little exercise. And this is exercise, is I want you to listen to me, but I also want to, you to be aware of the reaction inside your mind as I'm speaking. And how you respond to this way of talking. Because, as I am speaking, you will begin to notice that there are some pauses bit between my words. In those 
spaces, what was going on in your mind? You were silent. You were in listening mode, not in reacting mode, not in thinking mode. There it is again. And you see just how easy it is to be silent and how beautiful it is. You don't need to think. And it is just like a cool place of peace which is there for you. So by allowing people to have a taste of a silent mind. People are not afraid of it anymore. When it comes, they realize that is where wisdom, where peace, where even enlightenment will come. Not from the thoughts, they go round and round and round. They drive you crazy. And they are a cause of arguments for the silent mind. That's so cool. So that when we see our mind, our emotional world, we check just how busy it is. How peaceful are you? Right now. And this is where I started to develop what I call the peaceometer. It's just a pretty quiche word. Speedometer, an election swingometer and uh, whatever ometer you have. This is the um, peaceometer. How peaceful are you? So this is becoming mindful, aware of an important part of your mind. When you say be aware of your mind, it's like this huge thing. What part of my mind should I be aware of? Be aware of how peaceful you are or how agitated you are. The peaceometer. So, to help, give it a number. One to ten. Right now. You don't need to speak it out. You know, how peaceful are you? For one to ten. Now, at least you're aware of how your mind, how peaceful it is. Now, number two. What makes it more peaceful? What makes it agitated? You discover for yourself the cause of peace in your mind. And for those of you who are experts in Buddhism, you'll find that's the third Satipatthana practice. Knowing a mind, if it's in deep peace or if it's agitated. This is classic practice. And the cause of these things, the arising and passing away, the cause of peace and the cause of agitation. Find out. And that gives you, once you understand the way your mind works and what causes peace, it's pretty easy to generate more peace in the mind and to move away from agitation. So what causes agitation in your mind? It is wanting something. And for those of you, again, classic Buddhist teachings, when you want something, you will find that it disturbs your mind. Because we call that second noble truth meditation. The two types of meditation Second Noble Truth Meditation. What's the Second Noble Truth? Wanting causes suffering. Have you heard that before? Second Noble Truth, craving is the cause of suffering. Wanting causes separation from where you are and where you want to be. So wanting causes you stress. In the world you have to want something, but when you're meditating, that's wanting free zone. 
I said, give it a try. I don't want anything in the whole world. Later on afterwards, I get something. But right now, wanting, being peaceful. And then, when you let go of wanting, it's third noble truth. You let go of wanting, there's no suffering. And that brings back to Ajahn Chah again. He wouldn't use the cup, he'd use his hand. And as I was waiting to come in here, just uh, after breakfast, I was looking through the window of my room in the house over there, and there was a nice tree in front. Because it was very windy and a bit stormy, the tree was blowing all over the place. And I recalled Ajahn Chah's simile of why does a leaf or a branch move? It's not because it's part of the nature of a tree or a leaf to move. In fact, the default nature of a leaf is to be still. If you leave it alone, it's still by itself. It only moves because something outside of it is making it move. The wind. And Ajahn Chah continued with that simile by saying, your mind is essentially still. That's its nature, to be still. It only moves because you want something. You make it move. So if you stop making it move, no wanting, no aspirations, no goals, not trying to attain something, put all that aside, and then the leaf still moves, but less and less and less, until it becomes perfectly still, which is its default state. So that's how this mind works. We sit down, relax our body, and relax our mind. We don't want anything. We don't want anything in the whole world, just sitting here, just watching our peaceometer. Then, your breath starts to emerge. I always wondered why the breath was the most common meditation object used. And it became quite clear that when everything else settles down, there's actually two things which have to keep moving. One of them is the breath, the other one is obviously your heartbeat. But people aren't so aware of their heartbeat, but certainly you are aware of your breathing. When everything else is not moving, you can feel the rhythm of your breath. And the rhythm of your breath is very comforting. As long as you don't force it, if it's a natural breath, and I often wondered why that was the case, why it's a pleasant object to watch in its own right. And I remember just when I was in my mother's womb, that was the rhythm which you could feel, the rise and fall of her breathing in her stomach in the first few days of your life outside the womb, breastfeeding on your mother's chest. There too you could feel the rise and fall of your mother's breathing. It's a rhythm which has been embedded into us from the earliest times, which gives us a sense of warmth and safety and comfort. So the natural rhythm of the breath can be very reassuring and comfortable and easy to watch. So that's why when it does start to happen, you get very peaceful and your mind just starts to go onto your breath, breathing in, breathing out. In, out. It is naturally delightful, as long as you don't interfere with it. And just like the body becomes very delighted and very relaxed, just sitting here, so does your breath become delightful. When the breath becomes delightful, don't just you know, think, oh, it sh this shouldn't be happening, I should be doing something, I should be doing some insight or something. If you're enjoying this, well done. You're supposed to enjoy meditation. I've been a monk for 45 years now. I don't do this because I'm a masochist, because I'm afraid of relationships, or because I've got nothing else to do in my life, so I might as well become a monk. The reason you become a monk is you enjoy it. It's incredible fun. So much joy and happiness in deep meditation. So, when the mind becomes delighted, 
Let it be. Enjoy the delight of the mind. And when it tastes really delightful, then it's so delightful the breath, the breath just disappears. And the delight is all that remains. And beautiful lights and images in the mind. If you want these things, the wanting disturbs everything. If you just let it be, it happens by itself. This is a natural progression and you get into some incredibly deep, powerful states of mind. That's how the meditation works. Yeah, so you get into these deep meditations, you bliss out, get into ecstasy states. So what? That empowers your mind. You get really alert. Your mindfulness gets extremely sensitive. It's one of the things still in mindfulness training people still miss. It's not just being mindful. How powerful is that mindfulness? It's not like just turning on the lights. How intense are those lights? Until the mindfulness becomes superpower. Mindfulness. Really strong. So you can really see deeply into anything. That's where the meditation really starts to take off. And that's not just for monks and nuns. That's for you too. As long as you follow the instructions. What happens to many people is they only read the instructions when something goes wrong. He <laughs> but as a meditator, we read the instructions first before it goes wrong. And then we don't break so many apparatus. So that's the basic meditation. Any questions, comments, or complaints? No? Okay, if that's the case, we can just uh, have a stretch and then we'll do a guided meditation for half an hour.